Hello, and welcome to Leading the Standards with Atoll, where we explore the dynamic and engaging world of ISO management systems auditing, one episode at a time. Your hosts, triple certified ISO auditor and Atoll director, Jackie Stapleton, and myself, Kelly Taylor, her ever curious colleague, are here to guide you each week, along with the live contributions from our wonderful Atoll student community. So join us, not just to meet the standards, but to lead them. Oh my God. Today we are breaking down edition number 42 of our Lead the Standard newsletter, which is about turning your experience into a career in the ISO industry. So when people are thinking of a career change, do they really think about becoming an ISO auditor, contractor or consultant? Is this option even feasible uh, or does anybody even want to do these jobs? And why would anybody get excited about a career as an auditor? So in this episode, we're going to cover the following career considerations that you may have been wondering about already. And these are the hidden gems of ISO auditing, the pathway to a career in ISO auditing, and the practical steps to achieve your ISO career goals. So Jackie, we get asked this question all of the time. Can I really turn my experience into a career in the ISO standards? And in fact, we actually had a question from Sandy very recently, that, and I'll read this out. It said, hi, Jackie, I've been working in the manufacturing industry for over 15 years, primarily in quality control and regulatory compliance. But lately, I've been feeling like I need a change, and I'm not sure if my specific experience could be beneficial in another field. I've always been interested in systems and improving operational efficiencies. Can my background in manufacturing really translate into a career in ISO standards? particularly as an auditor or a consultant. I'm interested in the idea, but I'm unsure about the transition and whether my skills are appropriate. Do you have any advice or insights? They would be greatly appreciated. So I guess that's a great segue for me to hand over to you, Jackie. Thank you. Yeah, we get asked this all the time. And look, Sandy is just an example. And yes, she comes from a manufacturing background but it could be any one of us and it has been any one of us. But I guess the short answer is that you need to look at your experience but also your enjoyment in these four areas. And I'll break these down a little bit later, but these four areas are your systems focus. Do you actually love systems? Audits. I'm sure you're already conducting orders, but you might not call them that. So we'll explore that a bit more too. Improvement focus. Do you love improving systems and processes? I know we all do. And do you enjoy or do you get anything out of making a difference? So making a difference like positive changes to a business and the people that work in it and even the, the, um, the customers that are impacted by making that difference. So. As I said, I'll break it down a little bit more as we go down. Kelly did mention three things before, and they're the areas that I'm going to cover. The hidden gem of ISO standards and auditing, the pathway to a career in ISO auditing, and the practical steps as well. So I'll cover the first one, the hidden gem of ISO standards or auditing. And we call it the hidden gem because it's based on a story or a conversation that I had probably in the last few months. So I was out having a coffee with a group of ladies in my local area, um, all business owners. We get together once a fortnight and have a chat and share things with each other, any challenges we might have. One of the ladies um, actually brought up about her daughter, who I think she was in her late 20s, maybe early 30s, her daughter. And her daughter was unhappy in her salary position, um, you know, working in the city. I'm not sure what, what it was, but she, she had expressed that she wasn't happy. And I asked Savannah, well, what does she do? What, what's her background? And Savannah explained, oh, she's done her international business degree She loves, she also included some like sustainability and environmental studies in amongst that. And that's what she was passionate about. And 
Savannah said, oh, well, you know, she's thinking of going into teaching because she wants to, you know, share share her passion for the environment and sustainability with children, you know, as they grow up, like get to the younger generation. I said, well, that's fantastic. Has she considered ISO standards? And, of, of course, as we might all know, as soon as we even say ISO or auditing, people's eyes, like, glaze over, don't they? It's like... She, she actually had no clue what I was talking about. So I, I suppose I, I focused on ISO 14001 in that discussion, uh, environmental management systems, because that's what her daughter was passionate about. And I said, well, you know, with her business degree and her, her passion for sustainability and environment, she could actually share that with businesses and the people within it and the people impacted by the activities, products and services that, you know, they they produce or that does impact the environment. And, of course, Savannah still sort of had a blank look on her face. I sent, I sent her some information around what ISO 14001 was, what the industry was. But it, it sort of made me think or wonder how many people are actually out there that don't actually know anything about this ISO world, but have the transferable skills to move across to working in the ISO world. So when I was thinking about this, there were four things that came to mind for the type of person that this might suit and wanted to transfer across. So the four things were having a systems focus, Audits, you're already conducting them. Improvement focus and making a difference. Those are the four things that I shared earlier. Okay, so I'm going to break those four things down. So having a systems focus. I don't know about you, but I've always had a systems focus, even before I knew ISO existed. So this is actually quite relevant. Um, I'd been working for an IT company, software development company, for a, a long time as a trainer, first month support, um, you know, implementing uh, the software for new clients and helping them set up their business to use the software front end, so point of sale and back end. So part of that process was I was building systems. I was building procedures. I was streamlining processes to help onboard them. And still with this same company, this was back in the 90s, so, you know, a long time ago, still with this same company, an opportunity came up where they were looking at ISO 9001 certification. And uh, it was like a national company. I was based in the Brisbane office. Head office was in um, Melbourne. And so they sent like a, a job ad throughout the entire business in all states that they wanted someone to, you know, work in ISO 9001 and implement this system, whatever it was. And I had a look at it and I thought, well, that doesn't really make any sense to me. So I went and bought the standard ISO 9001. And I have shared this a lot with people. As I was reading the standard, I was... I like highlighting things. I was highlighting. In the end, I just gave up highlighting because the whole thing was just complete light bulb moments. I could not believe that someone had written a standard based on how I work. <laughs> it was, and I actually, I was talking to someone just the other day. Last week, I had coffee um, with someone that uh, reached out to me on LinkedIn, and he was the same. Um, he was working for Queensland Rail and he built all of these systems and then was introduced to ISO 9001. And when he read it, it was like, oh, my goodness, like, this is me. This is what I do. This, these are the systems that I produce. So if you already have that systems focus, if you've always loved to systemize things, um, sorry, I just remembered something else that goes right back to my childhood. In my report card, I used to have Jackie is very organized. But something that I used to do as a child, this is really weird. I'm being very open and honest here. As a child, probably 
nine or 10, I'm an early riser. I get up early and so was my dad. My mum and my brother were not. So I decided I'd draw up a chart and I put all of our names on it and I document each morning <laughs> what time we got up so that I could I could see, well, does dad get up earlier than me or do I get up more often than he does? Or yeah, mom and my brother, nah, they're, they're nowhere near it. But that way I could see, it was like a dashboard, right? So I was creating this stuff as a child. So I think it's something that that we're all, I don't know, it, it's within us. We know, oh, this is a system, I can improve it. And I know everyone here at Atoll is the same and I'm sure they've all got the same stories to tell or similar stories. So that's the first thing, a systems focus. Then the next thing is audits. It's a scary name, isn't it? Audits. And some of the um, businesses I have audited over the years don't actually call them audits, they're internal audits. So the one that I remember most is a peer review. Recently I came across a, like a peer assessment, okay? So you don't need to call them an audit, but we do tend to. That's what the standards refer to them as. But just because they're not called audits doesn't mean they're not audits. Okay, one that I share, and Kelly knows this, and I think Melissa is um, privy to this as well, doing our training recently. I have two sons. They're now in their 20s. One's nearly 30, actually. So, you know, this was a long time ago that I'm referring to. When they were in school, they'd come home. And, of course, as we know, homework. Homework's a nightmare. It was for me with two boys because they did not like doing their homework, didn't do it. I'm glad that's over. So they come home from school, sit down, <clears throat> start doing their homework. So I'd ask them, or, or they say, finish mom. I say, okay, <clears throat> have you done it all? Oh yes, yes, we've done it all. Okay. Said, so, well, can you show me what were you meant to have done? So back in those days, that was in a diary, for instance. It wasn't online or anything. It was in a diary or it might have been like an assessment sheet. So that's the criteria I was asking for. Okay, I was doing, I'm doing an audit. I'm asking them to show me. So they'd show me what was in their diary or on their um, assignment sheet. So in their diary, say, for instance, it says uh, complete uh, maths problems or questions from page five to ten. So, okay, that's what you were meant to have done. Can you show me that? So, of course, they'd show me their exercise book and I'd review. I'd go through and check, okay, is that actually questions five to ten or did they skip some or get bored at question seven and not continue? And on top of that, have they completed each question or did they get stuck? So I'm reviewing the evidence against the criteria to identify gaps and that's essentially what auditors do we're checking what was meant to have been done against what was done and determining the extent to which it's been completed are there any gaps okay so that's an easy one that's you know at home with your kids and homework we don't get paid for that but if you look at your uh, work experience and background Aren't we always reviewing what we're doing? Aren't we always reviewing procedures? Aren't we always reviewing procedures and thinking, oh, well, that's actually not applicable anymore. Are we actually doing it? So really look back on your roles, your activities, what you've done in your previous um, jobs or, you know, roles, as I said, and really look at it with different eyes and see whether it is was actually an audit. Okay, and why, why I'm pointing this out, <clears throat> it leads to how you sell yourself. So if you're updating your resume, for instance, because you're transitioning into the ISO industry, 
you want to use the language that potential employers or customers or clients are looking for. And of course, when we're looking for roles in ISO auditing, well, that's what, that's, they're the words that they're going to use. So that's the language we need to use in our resume or our LinkedIn profile, because that's what, what people are looking for. So with this, really look at what you've done. And then the next step is change the wording. Okay. If you're looking to get into a different industry, use their language. All right. The third one is an improvement focus. Now this sort of goes maybe hand in hand with that systems focus, but it is a little bit different because as we've discovered here at Atoll, an improvement focus is really looking at something and going, well, why are we doing it this way? There's a better way of doing it. And this is the way. Why don't we give this a go? Like it's about being able to see the big picture and Actually, it also, it's about getting frustrated. <laughs> We've seen things done that take additional time or it's duplicated and all of those things that some people just go, oh, well, that's just how we've always done it. It's just my job and, and they don't question it. So I know um, my son, my youngest son works in retail and he is continually frustrated when he comes home and I think he's more frustrated because he has no authority or power to change the processes um, within the retail sort of store that he works in so he feels yeah rather powerless and that that's unfortunate but you know just little things like um and we're going back to retail here and I don't have a background in re Oh, well, I do actually. I ran a service station for many years, 100 years ago, so I can understand. <laughs> but, you know, you, you count your till, you leave a float. He came home from, a, a, he works at two different Westfield locations and he comes home and he is frustrated because one location does this differently to the other location. So there's one issue for improvement, isn't it? If they're, they're you know, their co company run stores, all the stores should be run the same. So people can move between stores. But the big thing, and I think it's quite funny, is the other store that he works works at, um, you know, you, the, the change in the till, every day they just put all of the change, all of the denominations into one bag altogether. So every day, when the next shift starts, they've got to tip all of that out and separate all of the money again every day, <laughs> recount it and put it in the till. And then the next, that night, they just chuck it all in the same bag again. Just little things like that. When they do online orders, they, and if it's overseas, they need to go to the post office because they, they fill all their online orders in store. And if it's an overseas one, they have to go to the post office and get some sort of um, international label that they've got to fill in and put on the package. Anyway, every time they had an online order for overseas, they'd go to the post office and get a label. And Isaac was standing in the line one day, I think this was like pre-Christmas when it was quite busy, and was thinking, why am I doing this every single time? Why can't I just ask? for a whole pile of these labels and leave them in the store so we can fill them in. So he just asked the question and the lady goes, oh, yeah, that's no problem. So Isaac got, you know, a, a supply of these forms, brought them back and said, okay, this is the new process. So he's saved all of this time standing in a line, not just for him, for anyone that's responsible for filling these online orders. So it's... This improvement focus is about yeah, how you think and being aware of the potential improvements and not just sort of going with the flow. And I know, and Kelly and I, know, we know we'll own up to it, we get stuck in this a little bit when you've been doing something for so long, you sort of don't realise it because it's become second nature. 
that's where fresh eyes is really good um, and they can see what, what are you doing it this way for? So that's that improvement focus. So, again, like look, take a look around and see what you're aware of and I know our Atoll team has has this improvement focus. But and you'll also know other people. I I know someone. They just like doing the job the same way because they they uh, they think they're reserving or keeping their job by keeping it all to themselves. Okay, that's a whole other topic. I won't even go there. <laughs> and then finally, how do we? Well, what do we have to transition to ISO standards? And I mentioned this before, is we like to make a difference. We get something out of making a difference. Okay, And it's not, it's making a difference for the um, business that we work for or we might be contracting and consulting to. I know for me personally as a certification auditor, um, I love seeing the progression of the clients I work with um, and seeing the light bulb go off that they actually understand that, oh, these ISO standards actually benefit my business and benefit the people that work within the business and benefit my, my clients and customers. I love seeing that light bulb moment. And sometimes it does, doesn't happen straight away. It takes persistence and consistency um, but we, we like seeing that and making a difference does that make sense Absolutely. yeah Absolutely. yeah I just want to quickly touch Jackie on that improvement focus as you said we get stuck in it here like we've just had three new team members come on in the last six months and most of my job the last few weeks has been listening to their feedback about how we do things and it's not just about is there a better way it's can anybody do this task can anybody do this job because you and I are able to do some of those tasks really quickly and really efficiently um, and we've discovered with Melissa thankfully she has an improvement mindset as well that just because we can do them efficiently doesn't mean someone new can and we've been able to completely flip those processes so even if you are writing a process or improving something, make sure that you do get some feedback buying from other people as well. So you need to be open, open to improvement, open to feedback. Um, so you can apply all of those knowledges. So if you uh, yeah. have that mindset, then absolutely that's going to transition into any career. Yeah, yeah. And actually I like that, that, that open to improvement um, mindset as well taking it on board, not getting defensive, understanding that, um, yeah, there, there are other ways of doing things. Yeah, different people think yeah. differently. And, and yeah. again, another example is Hazel. She looks at things completely differently to the person who was in the role before her. So we've yeah. adapted and adjusted for her. So, yeah, yeah. Be, be open to other people and their experiences and their um, yeah, work to make yourself redundant, as you said, but yes. not to lose your job but to make things easier for others absolutely yeah yeah so that's a good recap then thanks kelly that um you know i, th I think with this topic the hidden gem of iso standards i wanted to really one uncover that it is there don't for don't forget about us but then it's about identifying well what is it that i have in my current role that i can take to this new area or, or sector or industry, okay? And just to recap, it's that systems focus. You're already doing audits and improvement focus. And I'll add what Kelly said there, that open to improvement um, mindset as well, and that you really love making a difference. Yeah. Okay? So I encourage you to look back on what you've actually done, how you fit into those four or five areas and what that looks like for you and how that can transition into other areas. But before I move to um, the pathway, the next uh, topic, in uh, the article number 42, the news article uh, 42 that Kelly mentioned earlier, this is what we're breaking down this time, which was all about 
uh, turning your experience into a career. I did reference an external article in there that I thought was quite interesting. It was uh, 60 plus career change statistics. I'll say it again. <laughs> 60 plus career change statistics for 2024. So um, it was like a UK based one, but um, I think you know we can we can take it as, as it is, but it was quite interesting because it stated that 32% of Britain's working population struggle to find other fields in which they could use their current skills. So with what we've just done and broken those four areas or five, because Kelly threw an extra one in. That's exactly where we're heading. That's what we're hoping to help you with to understand what you can take to other fields, your current skills to other fields. Okay, so they said 32% of the working population just cannot figure out, well, what can I pick up and what can I take somewhere else? And that they also said that only 16% know exactly how they could transfer their skills to a different career path. That's really low, isn't it? Only 16% know exactly how they can transfer them. So the first step here is what is it that I can transfer? And then once you're over that hurdle and recognise, you know, what you can transfer, the next hurdle is, well, how do I do it? What are the next steps? And then another 31% say they don't have enough knowledge in another field to make a career change. And when I read that, I, I through my experience in talking to lots of different people transitioning their careers, a lot of people do doubt their experience. Mm. They do doubt that what they actually already know isn't enough. To, to transition. That was uh, evident in the email we received from Sandy that Kelly read out earlier. Like you can you can see that doubt. Well, can I really do this? Okay, so there's all, and look, this is so common. If you're thinking this, you obviously you're not on your own. Okay, so we can work with those stats. I've so help show you what it is you can transfer and how to go about thinking about it and changing the way you're thinking to identify your transferable skills, I am going to share some points on how you can transfer those skills as well, what it might look like to start that process, okay? I'm not going to tell you that it's easy, quick, simple, because it takes, and I like using these, these uh, words with, the clients I work with who are transitioning their careers, it's not a quick fix. You, persistence and consistency, you have to keep showing up, even when it gets frustrating that nothing's coming back. Okay, it's just persistence and consistency, putting yourself out there. I always say test and learn, test and learn, test and learn. Did that work? Test and learn. Okay. Oh, funny. That's continual improvement. <laughs> so everything that we do, and I often say this when I write different things, it can all come back to an ISO standard. <laughs> There's a clause in there for everything. So that's a bit of a recap on that uh, section on the hidden gem of ISO standards. So Kelly, have you got anything to add to that before I move on to the pathway? No, I think we've covered quite a lot there. I think there's okay. a few little gems in there for everyone to think about. But, yeah, de okay. definitely. Thank you. Oh, you're going to share soon anyway, so that's great. <laughs> so the next section is the pathway to a career in ISO, um, you know, whether it's auditing or implementing or, uh, you know, a, a certification auditor, a trainer. There's so many different options. So... In the article uh, newsletter, um, <clears throat> sorry, newsletter 42 that Kelly referenced earlier, and I'm sure we'll share a link to that, won't we, Kelly? Absolutely. Because um, it is on LinkedIn. You'll see I created uh, an ISO qualification pathway model. Okay, It's simply a Venn diagram. 
Okay, I like breaking it down and making it simple. I identified three different areas that I thought would support us in our career transition into ISO standards. The three areas were industry experience, qualifications, and ISO standards. Okay, pretty simple, really. We've talked about experience and your transferable skills as experience. I'm, I mentioned here industry experience. Now, this is where we're all unique. We can all get our qualifications, which is the second one. So I'll skip ahead and come back, seeing that's naturally taking me there. We can all get our qualifications as a lead auditor. We can all get our specialist qualifications in quality, environment, OH&S, um, even food safety, information security, whatever it is uh, that we're interested in. But what sets us apart are the industries and sectors, our backgrounds. Okay, so my industry and sector backgrounds are completely different to Kelly's, completely different to Christine, Chris, I'm guessing, and Melissa. That's our uniqueness that we bring to the table. Okay, so we can all get this general uh, knowledge in our qualifications with ISO standards and how to conduct an audit, like I always say the principles and processes, but then what, what's important important for us to bring to the table is our industry or sector experience. So when I moved into certification audits, my, in, my main industry and sector background um, was construction. So even though I started my quality, quality journey in software development, I after 10 years of working there as a quality manager, I moved into a different quality and environmental role, and that was in construction. So that's where I got, got my experience. That was a complete career transition. I still took my ISO knowledge, but I had to learn a completely new industry, new language. They called the acronyms are out of this world. So you can see you can pick up those basics and move it across, but that um, industry experience really supported my transition into um, certification auditing. So really look at what your industry experience is. And on that, on that note, what I found very beneficial, and I talked about this before, is like updating your resume or your, say, LinkedIn profile um, and Sorry for pulling you in on this, Christine, for the live live stream. But Christine comes from a certification body background, a conformity assessment body. And it's really important to understand the industries that they have experience in because sometimes, um, particularly conformity assessment bodies, they're looking for a particular auditor that can audit a client in that industry. They may be short on auditors that have that industry experience. So it's really important to highlight your industry and sectors on your resume or in your LinkedIn profile. Okay, it's really beneficial to share that. And I always, um, some, something that uh, we do um, in as a certification auditor, they call it ANSIC codes, A-N-Z-S-I-C codes. There's also, is it NACE codes, N-A-C-E, which is similar, and they're all the different industry or sector types. They're a good, look, it's very complicated. There's a lot there, but it's a good guide to try and align your own industry experience with, okay? So the pathway to moving forward is understanding your industry experience and highlighting it, ensuring you have the relevant qualifications to move into that industry. And look, if it's into systems, I say world, you, you can do the specialist courses like quality environment, OH&S. 
a lead auditor is always um, it's not it's not even optional. I would say it's great to tag on with anything. You can take it with you anywhere. Um, I will put a what's the word? There is a risk here, and this happens a lot with the people I work with with their career transitions. They seem to want to do every course available to man, <laughs> and it's not really relevant. It's like. It, they, they always seem to think, oh, no, if I just do this course, then then I'll make it happen. Oh, no, now I just need to do this course and now I'll just do this course. It's sort of like over-qualifying stuff that's not even relevant. So you really need to identify what it is you're doing and stick to that, okay, focus on that. And if it's systems, ISO systems, really that's all you need. Yes, you can do your cert four um, in OH&S, but do you really need to do an ICAM course? Like that's, you do need to do an ICAM course if you want to work in the technical operations level of OH&S and safety, but not if it's in systems. You need to have an understanding of what it is, but you're not going to be conducting it. Okay, so just be careful that you don't just want to keep doing all of these courses. Personally, it's great if you're a continual learner. It means, oh, Kelly, this is what we've forgotten. What? The, the word, curious. Oh. It, look, that was a requirement of it, <laughs> one of the things that we I advertise for in all of our positions. If you want to be a member of the ASL team, you must be curious. I don't yes. Know you missed yes. That. Yeah, so being curious is, yeah, that's that's a key point. Always, yeah, always be curious. So I'm going to throw that one in there. Um, and then finally, and I probably already covered this inadvertently, was ISO standards. Mm. So we, we do need to have an understanding of that criteria um, as well. So carry it around with you, read it, apply it, um, I say to people that may not um, work in it directly, um, if, if you're an employee, you can implement, implement a system. I don't know, have a play. What does it look like? You can have um, informal audits and review the system that, the, you know, the organisation that you're working for has. Identify the gaps. Okay, that's it's all accessible to you, and there's no reason why you can't just start applying it. So, I think this is a good segue to you, Kelly. Thank you, appreciate that. Because I, I'm sort of picking on Kelly here because Kelly has worked for Atoll for nine years this year, a long time. Mm. We haven't got sick of her yet, um, <laughs> but. Kelly does our internal audits here. We're, Kelly and I are the internal audit team and she's never conducted an internal audit before. But I just thought it would be nice, Kelly, for you to share your background yeah. and how it was not auditing yeah. and how you used your industry experience, qualification, and while it's not ISO standards because that's not what we get audited against, we get audited against other standards, which is sort of similar to quality, how you applied that, those three elements. Yep, absolutely. So um, for those who don't know me, my background, um, I started in property management in real estate, managing rental properties uh, across um, South Brisbane. Um, and with that comes a lot of responsibility, looking after other people's properties. Everything needs to be documented. There are systems, processes. Um, and my only experience there as far as, Auditing was being audited by the accountants for the trust account, being audited by the franchise um, to make sure that we were meeting the franchise requirements, so um, hitting brand, all those sorts of things, making sure we were following the company policies as well as our, our office's policies. So my experience with that was never fun. Um, it was always somebody who was really strict. There was no... It was black and white there was no room for interpretation um it was always a very stressful and daunting experience because of the type of people that were conducting those audits on us 
Um, so I was in that role in that industry for probably close to 10 years. Uh, and then I had enough um, and moved into um, a within that role. Sorry, I started as uh, had uh, experience in there as an office manager, as well as the team manager and those sorts of things as well. And I did get sick of the inability to make change and the red tape and the regulations and other people's lack of personal accountability. So I moved into uh, a PA role um, for a large property developer. So my background and my experience in real estate, my understanding of that helped me to get into the the property development industry. Um, I said, was a team assistant there, moved into a PA, EA role, And it wasn't really until I got to Atoll that I realised those transferable skills and those experiences there. Again, when I was at the property developer, um, my only experience with auditors was very similar. And we had ISO audits then. A lot of our um, subcontractors needed to have um, um, OH&S. They needed to be certified to an OH&S and an environmental standard. Um, That was a requirement of being a subcontractor of the company. So we were having ourselves being audited against those as well as auditing our subbies. Again, not a very pleasant experience. It was always stressful. There was always people running around and the auditors sat in the meeting room and they just read documents. Never did I see them go out on site or anything like that. Um, I was made redundant from that role. So I moved into a philanthropic company. I was there for six months uh, and again, I looked at all of their systems and processes and they're managing quite literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in big gifts, um, taking, speaking with donors all across the country. Some of those were multi-million dollar donors. And there were systems all over the place. We had filing cabinets for some charities we were working with. We had computer systems for others. We had one program that looked after one lot of donor lists and then we had an Excel spreadsheet for another project. And again, I found that really frustrating, like there was no consistency. So one of the first things I did in my role there was I pulled everything onto the digital system. Everything was the same and grouped everything into groups. Now, I was not like Jackie. I did not get up early in the morning as a child and write a list of when everybody got up. I was the one who was still in bed dreaming about running, going outside and running around and not being near a computer, near anything academic. I hated all of that. But as I worked, got further through my career, I realised how much I loved systems and structure and all of those sorts of things Um, and, yeah, and consistency. So I left that role um, for a number of reasons um, and started working with Atoll. I decided to study, started at Atoll part-time in a customer service, training and assessment, everything role. I was the first employee here and Thankfully, there were some systems and structures, but very quickly I learned a different way of auditing. Um, I had Jackie and our other directors around me teaching me that auditing can be fun, showing me how my experience in systems and following processes and writing procedures actually applied to the different parts of the auditing um, reading, yeah, understanding the concepts. So as Jackie said before, we don't um, audit um, ISO standards or we don't sorry, conform to ISO standards here. We do follow the structure for quality management systems within everything we do, but we're not certified. So we still apply everything that we teach. We just are not certified. Um, we're audited by Exemplar Global and we're audited by ASQA. Now, ASQA is government. They're quite strict, black and white, etc. cetera. Um, Exemplar Global they're still quite strict, but they they have a bit more of a friendly, outgoing personality. I can tell you now which one I much prefer to be audited by, um, and that's the philosophies that we use here. But again, everything that I've done along my career has transitioned into an understanding around um, internal auditing in general. I'm able to read, interpret, find improvements, etc., along the way. So I didn't have any experience as an auditor but I had been audited. I had followed systems, processes, seen improvements. Um, and that's how I've ended up in this role in training assessment, uh, auditing and business management. 
Um, one of the things that Jackie mentioned before is that understanding of ISO standards, and I'm going to kind of segue back to Jackie with a story here. I don't know the ASQA standards inside out. I don't know the exemplar global requirements inside out. I don't know the ISO standards inside out, but I have a copy at arm's reach of every single one and I still refer to them. So Jackie mentioned earlier, you need to have an understanding of the ISO standard. You don't need to memorize them, have them handy, use mm -hmm. them, You'll find that that's easy in an audit too. When, when we do our internal audits, we have the criteria here and we will both read them and make sure we've understood and interpreted them, not throwing them off the top of our head. So just yeah. because you don't have that muscle memory of what they say doesn't mean that you still can't audit to them. I think that's a really important element there as well. Yeah. Well, hopefully I've covered that's kind right. of what to pull from me yeah. Thank you for sharing. And with the um, standards, whatever the criteria is, you'll find by using them when you've actually got a real world, real life example, you end up learning it better. Like, I, you know, in our virtual training, we have scenarios to try and get that application working. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, I always, as you know, I have them on hand, um, and I do know them pretty well, but I still want to know the exact words that apply. Um, something Kelly also mentioned that I thought was worth mentioning and I missed was being an auditee is experience. Kelly shared that, that she was an auditee, was that they weren't good experiences, but you know, and again, a lot of people tell us this, that, you know, they've been audited and the auditor, you know, with like the quality police and, yeah, it wasn't a very nice experience and it does, it shouldn't be that way. So being an auditee is definitely, yeah, experience. I count that as experience, yeah. Thanks for sharing, Kelly. We're up to the final uh, steps here because this is the important thing is, well, what to do. You know, I, I mentioned that percentage that, I think it was six, only 16% don't know how to implement it, how to change, what to do, what does it look like. So, and look, this I, I may have already covered this, so it might be a recap as well. Your steps, if you're watching or listening this, these are your steps. There's four steps. Identify your experience. I hope we've given you enough examples of how to go about that. Um, so look at your past work experience. Um, which industri industries have you come from? What do you know well? Where do you, where does your passion lie? Also, what do you enjoy doing? And look, it might not even be in your work or your career. It could be something that you do as a hobby. Okay, and that's probably more so where your passion lies. So really. Take, take a look at your experience, okay, and see what you can do and where, where you need to go, okay. I had a Zoom with a client yesterday that's just starting out. She had all of these different pots of experience, but they were quite broad. And I asked her or suggested maybe you just need to narrow it down first. What do you actually love doing the most? Let's just focus on that first. Because otherwise it's like a scattergun approach. It's like, what are we doing? So take a look at your experience. Get your qualifications up to date. Okay, so do some research. What qualifications do you need for the direction you are moving into? Okay, and of course, when you are looking to gain your qualification, make sure you find a training provider that actually is certified or can give you the relevant certificates that are recognised as well. If you're unsure, um, you can talk to us on that. Um, try and get some practical experience. So I mentioned sort of uh, earlier that if you're not um, working within a, a business already that has a ISO certification, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're not on the on internal audit team. You can start doing it informally. Conduct reviews of their systems against the um, criteria, if that's the ISO standards. Okay, Write up an audit report. Have a go at it. 
Okay, get involved in projects or see see what opportunities arise. Like just like I did a hundred years ago when I moved into my quality role, there was a job that came up, and I thought I don't even know what that is, but I got I got the job, and that was yeah the change that I needed. So try try and yeah get that practical experience, um, and then of course when you've got all of those ducks lined up, so. You understand, identify your experience. You've got your qualifications. You're getting some practical experience as well. Then you can start planning your transition. What does it look like? Okay, whether you're moving into another salary role or you want to build your own consultancy, I always go down the path of a portfolio career. Okay, nothing that I have started I just went all or nothing. Okay, when I was on salary and I knew I wanted to um, st- go out on my own as a consultant, I started doing that on the side. Okay, while I still was in the in the salary position. Okay, until I was at a point where I could go. Okay, goodbye. I'm right to go here now. And then I did a little bit of uh, certification audits while I was still consulting. Okay, while I was doing certification audits, I started at all. I'd, I'd go out and do my audits. I'd come home because I was the sole person. Um, as Kelly said, she was a first employee um, and I'd have to respond to emails. We didn't have a CRM back then. And I, I would have to um, yeah, talk to and manage all of the inquiries. So I did it on the side as I went. Okay, so everything has been uh, like, a, you know, as I said, it's a portfolio career. Okay, so, and I don't like using the word side hustle <laughs> because if you call it a side hustle, it's always going to be a side hustle. Okay, if that's what you want as a side hustle, that's fine, but I call it portfolio. All right, so plan your tra- transition. What does that look like? So have you got anything to add to that? Kelly, before I do a final recap. No, I think we have covered a lot. I'm hoping yep, that okay. I've got something out of it today. Okay, so just to recap then, don't forget about ISO. <laughs> it's out there. Um, really take a look at what uh, experience and skills you can transition into the ISO world. Um, don't forget that pathway to the, your career as well. So that includes like your experience, um, your qualifications. I say ISO standards because, of course, that's the criteria um, that we work, well, we audit against and we work with here. But the criteria could be anything. Like as Kelly mentioned, our criteria is um, Example Global and ASQA required standards, right? So understand that pathway. And then, of course, these practical steps to move forward, identify your own experience, get your qualifications, get some practical experience, and then put a plan in place, right? So I think that's it, Kelly, but I think now we want to hear from any Atoll community members. Is that right? Yes, so I am going next. To, yeah, I am going to open the floor to our Atoll community members. Firstly, um, our lovely live streamers that are here with us or our Zoom participants. Um, did any of you have any questions you wanted to ask or add to um, Jackie's comments today? Chris, Melissa, Christine, anything that you'd like to add? Right, I'm happy to unmute. Chris. Oh, we cannot hear you, my friend. See, look, bloopers. First blooper of the of the, <laughs> the season. <laughs> Chris I've is used muted, chat. He, just do you want to throw your question in chat if you like, Chris? That's not a problem. We've got um, some people on Facebook as well if you wanted to leave your chats in the comment. Um, I do have one that has come through really quickly. Um, Jackie, and look, this might be something that we have up our sleeve already um i've got another question here um quality over deadlines is something that i am passionate about i hope to spread that mindset to my team i'm really excited about our upcoming team meeting and getting some into some productive discussions with my boss 
by the way, if you have a spare moment, of course we do, um, I would like to pick your brain a bit about handling bosses with different priorities, particularly when it comes to navigating situations where quality isn't their top concern. Mm. What are your thoughts on that one? Yeah, I've come across that and I've probably come across it in environmental management as well, sort of. The warm, fuzzy stuff doesn't work. And I, I, I won't go into, into it in too much detail because I think that's a good um, separate session to get into. But that's something I learned. Um, yeah, as I said, the warm, fuzzy stuff doesn't get the attention of the bosses. And I'll use this as an example. Um, and Kelly can, can uh, I suppose, share her experience with me. Kelly wanted a CRM and I always, like, like we use HubSpot as our CRM and the running joke is I said, oh, that, that costs $55 million. It's very expensive. And I pushed back and I pushed back. It could have been a couple of years. But Kelly kept hounding me because all I could see was, oh, that's just going to cost all of this money. Why am I putting all of this money into this thing? <laughs> what am I getting out of it? And until Kelly was able to sell it to me as to what the return on that investment would be, that's when I started seeing the benefits of it, if that makes sense. So I don't, you can add to it if you want from your experience, from your side, Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've been through that. I've pushed back. Like how much is it? That's ridiculous. Can't we just get a free one? It's like, <laughs> but but now we can see the power of, and this isn't an ad for HubSpot <laughs> by any means, but I thought it was a really good example of a boss pushing back and only seeing the money going out mm. until Kelly turned it around and demonstrated why it was a good investment. So it the same applies to implementing a system and getting your boss on board, you need to get back to the why. Mm. Why do you, why are you implementing it? Have there been previous incidents, customer complaints, you know, impact financially, uh, stakeholders? So I'm writing the news article as we speak in my head. So, yeah, um, I might address that uh, separately, but the, the key thing with that is, get back to why and really demonstrate the value of the investment. Yeah, absolutely. When your boss says, I can't spend $55 million on a new product, let them know that they're already spending $65 million on four different products plus employee time. That's how you <laughs> into a and new business. It wasn't $55 million. <laughs> no. It's just I use that much money all the time. like yeah I just say that as a throwaway term as meaning that's expensive <laughs> yeah. it hasn't offered to pay any of us 55 million <laughs> working on it <laughs> So on Hi. that note, I am going to call a close on today's episode. Sorry, Jackie, I know we could talk about that for ages. So um, I do want to thank everyone for joining us on this insightful journey through the world of ISO standards and the exciting career opportunities they present. So remember, every step you take towards understanding and leveraging ISO standards can pave the way into a transformative career. So keep pushing the boundaries and explore new possibilities within this field. Thanks for joining us once again as we lead the standard. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast for more episodes just like this. And don't forget to leave a review if you found today's episode informative and inspiring. If you're already an ATOL student, remember participating in live Q&A sessions just like this is one of the exclusive perks of your enrolment. And if you're not already a student, join us at our website, www.auditortrainingonline.com to learn more about our courses and how you can start making a difference in your career in ISO management system standards. So join us again next week as we not just meet the standards, but we lead them.